The writer and star of the show and the leading lady, uh, Johnny Owens and Vicky McClure. I just want to watch it again. That's what I'm going to see you right now. So we've just been watching some of the clips that we're, we're going to show you guys in a second. And just from seeing those three clips, I'm like, I want to watch it again, <laughs> again and again. Um, Johnny, let's start with you. Where, where's the idea for this this come from? Because this this, this the life of Svengali started before this feature film as well in, a, in another form. Is that right? Yeah, it did. It started online uh, in uh, January 2009. Myself and Roger Evans, who plays Horsey. Uh, I'd moved to London, and uh, he was a, we'd acted together for like about 40 years in Welsh series. So we decided to do something online to see how it went. You know, the, the internet is full of stuff like, you know, cats on skateboards and <laughs> you know, the usual <laughs> clips. So we thought, why don't we do something with a bit of a story and a bit of a narrative? And uh, I'd been in a band myself in the mid-90s that was signed, so I knew the world. And uh, we thought we'd do something in that world where somebody would come to London and... Uh, he had the new, you know, he had a band that he wanted to get signed, and his best friend was a record label manager, so that was his one contact there to go there and try and get this band signed. So that was the that was the basis of it, and we did a two-hander together, that was um, put on the internet, and uh, it was picked up at the Evening Standard. They said it was the best thing on the net, which was amazing, and uh, you know, sometimes the media still works in a very traditional way. A few broadsheets sort of agreed and went along with it, mm. and uh, it kind of went from there. Really, Alan McGee got involved in the second episode, and. Um, there was a period then of it sort of being online and, and people sort of really liking it. It's quite a nice story of, of almost like art imitating life in a way as well, isn't it? In terms of of, of this thing and, and being so passionate about it and believing in it. And then it becomes a feature film as well. It's such a, a lovely story. How did how did you make that transition from it being the online um, episodes to, to then becoming a feature film? Well, what happened was um, I had a, a very uh, an email on... A very early doors, because what I did was I did the first few virals and I put my contact details on the end, sort of trusting the world out there. And I never got, n n I got one or two nutters, but not many. I'm, Mostly I'm assuming you've changed those details. Yeah, yeah. well, not, not <laughs> only about a year ago, <laughs> somebody <laughs> noticed and when your email address is still there. But I remember I had an email off Tim Lovejoy, who was doing Channel B at the time. And he, he said to me, look, I really like this. And, you know, if you want to chat about stuff and any help with anything, let me know. So I met him for a coffee and he said to me, um, hold on to it for as long as you can, because the more successful it gets, uh, the more power you'll have in, you know, keeping what is, you know, the central sort of basis of it, the philosophy of it as well, yeah. which is quite punky, really, in looking back in the sense of we didn't really know what we were doing. It was illegal. We didn't have any sort of insurance. Or, you know, <laughs> we didn't contact the council. So don't do it at home, kids. You know, you can't do that. So we did it. And, and I kind of like... I got to the point where I was flirted with by a lot of broadcasters and production companies, you know, sort of, um, I met all the major channels about it because they all liked it. Yeah. But a private investor got involved uh, through a guy called Martin Root, who was a creative design agency. And he rang me, it was quite funny. And I used to get phone calls from people who were just looking to sort of make money or get money from me, which was ridiculous because I didn't have any money. And I thought, because he was a creative de design agency, that he wanted me to do something and pay him. And I had not attitude in this phone call, but I was a bit like, oh, mate, you know, there's no point me meeting you. I haven't got any cash. There's nothing. And he went, no, no, I want, you know, I might want to invest in this. So I went, oh, OK. So I met him and he's got an office in Shoreditch. And I went in and he went to me, this could be a feature film. I love the concept. I can raise the money to make it and I can put you on this wage every month until we make it. And I kind of left, and I, I honestly, I sat on the curb outside. <laughs> and I had a bit of a moment going, did that just happen? And he was as good as his word, and, and he raised the money, and we made a movie, and it was as simple as that. Wow. I know. What a great story. Yeah, it's mental, isn't it? <laughs> how, did you, how did you get this young lady involved then? Well, there's a story here. That's your fault. <laughs> what happened was I was, um, I'd raised the money at that point, and yeah. um, what, what happened was um, the, the investor said the only thing I want was Martin Freeman to say he'd do it. And Martin had done the virals. He'd seen it through a mutual friend of ours called Paolo Hewitt, the writer. Yeah. And he approached me. He rang me and said, uh, can I be in the viral? Wow. And it was just at the time when he... I remember him saying to me, we met in a Wagamama's in Soho. <laughs> and he said to me, um, <laughs> I'm doing this thing called Sherlock Holmes. And I can remember thinking, oh, OK. You know when somebody says something, you go, yeah, oh, yeah, right, no OK. Idea. And it's obviously it's become a phenomenon now. It's a fantastic <laughs> television series. But at the time, I just went, oh, nice one. And then a, he does my viral, and about a month later, he goes, I think I've got The Hobbit. <laughs> 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 so I was like, oh, nice one, Martin. It's kind of taken off you a bit. And he was like, yeah, great guy. <laughs> so then the investor said, could you get Martin to guarantee he'd do the film? So I said, well, I'll try. 
So I emailed him and he emailed me back from New Zealand. Amazing email, just going, I will do Johnny Owen's film, you know. Sort Amazing. Of, you know, I'll give him my kidney <laughs> and he'll, I'll do the movie <laughs> and, and I will come back and I'll film this film. And I, I was able to go to invest and go, there's Martin. He was as good as his word. And Brilliant. That was it. But I needed the, um, once I got Martin, I had the money, but I needed a really good leading lady. And uh, what happened was I was going home at Christmas 2011 and a mate of mine who's here now called Cardiff Dave, who's from Cardiff. Hi, Cardiff Dave. <laughs> he's on the radio and what he does is, it's quite funny, when we drive back to Wales, he's got the Stone Roses' first album and I'm not allowed to put it on until we get to somewhere around Swindon way because it times perfectly with the ride in Wales. <laughs> so he says to me in his very Cardiff accent, Leave it on that side there, Radio 1. So I'm like, all right, you know, so I've got Radio 1 on, and it's Edith Bowman talking to Vicky McClure. Now, I'm a massive fan of This Is England. I think it's an incredible series, and she plays this character, Lol, who is sort of, you know, beautifully tragic, you know, but it's very serious, dark stuff. But she was very funny with you. Remember she was talking about, like, vacuuming the yeah, bedroom? TLC. TLC. Yeah. It was all that. And I said to Dave, she sounds amazing. She sounds really like funny, you know. And, and I, I, and I kind of had this thing where I went, she sounds like she would want to do a comedy because she's got that, you know, lightness about her, and, you know, humour. So I says, I'm gonna try to get her. And everybody should have a mate like Cardiff Dave. He looked at me and he went, I think you'll get it as well. <laughs> ah, thanks, Dave. So I went back to Wales and then I went back to London and I said to the production people, um, I heard Vicky McLean on, on Edith Bowman's show and she sounded great. They were very funny. Can we try and get her? She just won the BAFTA. And we, we got in touch with her agent. Here's a good lesson about agents. And they said, she's in Russia filming Anna Karenina with Joe Wright. And she's just got eight scripts to read in the next few days. So you can imagine we were like <laughs> way down the list. But I was able to send her the script and the viral. And there's a good lesson for people. When you can visualize something, it doesn't have to give you a head start. Yeah. Because straight away the agent come back and said, we really like this. Um, and they got it to Vicky. And Vicky, bless her, uh, obviously read it, and I didn't know this, liked it. But then there was, was a whole thing where they went, she wants to speak to Johnny on the Monday morning. So I had all weekend, and then the whole office is going, oh, when she speaks to Johnny, it'll be all right. And I'm thinking, fucking pressure. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. So um, I, had, I took some deep breaths, and I remember the number coming through. Uh, 0115 or something, not a number, isn't it? Yeah, that's Nottingham code. And, um, <laughs> and I, I answered this phone, and, and it was Vicky, and she went, uh, within 30 seconds, I love the script, Johnny, I want to do the part. So I could relax then, and half an hour later, we ended the call by saying, I'm me going, because the central message of this film is that love is the most important thing. And she went, I, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> so we sort of got off to a good start, you know. And I really didn't have eight scripts. <laughs> <laughs> I've just got a really good agent. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. What 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 connected with you? What was it? Uh, what what did you? What jumped out at you? Um, there was lots of things that jumped out. There was the fact that it was, you know, it wasn't like an obvious comedy. It was drama. It was a romance film. It was, you know, the soundtrack was so important to the film. Um, and, you know, I did want to speak to Johnny because I could tell by watching the virals that, you know, these were really interesting, real, you know, film lovers. And I kind of wanted to just, you know, have a chat with him. And it was exactly what I thought it was. And we got on really well from the start. But, you know, even if I didn't have the virals, the script was strong <laughs> enough for me to go, I'm in. But like Johnny said, you very rarely get to see something sort of, you know, on its way visually before you sort of decide to go ahead because I, I got it straight away I could understand what he was trying to do and um, obviously there's bits from the virals that he's put in the film but the film was way you know much further on and um, all the characters that he was pulling and I was like okay that's cool that you've got Martin Freeman and you know all these other people that he'd managed to sort of you know that wanted to be involved yeah um, well, well, we've got some clips that we, we want to share with you guys right now. The first one is um, is, is Dixie and Horsey, which is where it all started with the story with, with you guys, you know, yeah. in terms of you two doing the virals. Um, and, uh, and the persistence is just, <laughs> it's just brilliant. Have a look at this. <laughs> I am... Um, I think I said to someone after seeing the film, everybody needs a Dixie in their life. Oh, yeah, the, I'd agree. Just the, t the, the, the enthusiasm for for life basically <laughs> is infectious um nothing phases him no. whatsoever was it easy for you to 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 write it you know like vicky says a few of the scenes that are in the virals are in the film but 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 kind of you know making that into a feature and making his story and and his appeal you know last that that length of time was that an easy thing for you to do to 
I yeah, I did. I kind of I reveled in that really because I was able to expand everything that I wanted to expand. You mm. know, I had the money and the, the the scope to do it. I could bring the band in, which I really wanted to do in the virals, but I couldn't. And obviously, I could make you know Shell much more pivotal and important, and I could sort of grow that world, the world of rock and roll. Um, I kept those kind of things, which were similar to the virals, which is the rhythm of how me and Roger talk in a very Celtic way, as you'd know. Mm. Uh, the people really like uh, Henry Normal, who's an exec producer on it, loved those scenes. He said, yeah. you know, the rhythm of how you talk, the Welsh, where it's <laughs> He used to say, you've got to keep those in, you know, and uh, I enjoyed keeping those in. But, you know, as far as the film was concerned, I was able to sort of do stuff like move through those streets in Soho that people recognise, you know, Berwick Street and all those great, you know, the market yeah. and stuff like that. I was able to sort of show what it's like when you're walking around. And those characters, like you said, like Horsey, who look like a classic a and Arminist G-star, sort of almost yeah. sort of weird uniform that they wear, you know, which is almost some, some militaristic, isn't it, you know, yeah. the way they are. But then there's this guy who actually wears a parka, not, you know, not ironically at all, because he loves being what he is, which is a music fan. Yeah. And he's got this band and he's discovered them. And I think... We all know uh, people that go to a big city and reinvent themselves. There's nothing wrong with that, you know. It's like you move on, you change, and what what you are and what you've been is is different. You even change your name, and I'm, I'm this now, and you know it's a creation of a new person. But every so often, somebody arrives from that world, from your previous world, and goes, "I know you. You're so and so. We were best mates," and you kind of don't want to know that. So we, that was the basis of mine and Rogers, sort of, you know, sort of characters, I suppose. The one Celt that arrives in the big city and goes, "Right, knew me." I'm this, mm. and the other one that arrives going, all right, mate, <laughs> how's it going, <laughs> yeah. you know? Remember back in the day when we used yeah. to do this? And he doesn't want to know that. So Reminds that him of all the things that he, he's changed. Yeah, all the things that he thinks he's moved on from, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and uh, you know, not important to him anymore. So, you know, I, and I was really pleased in Wales because people were saying there were lots of different Welsh characters in this, good, bad, you know, loving, sort of, you know, nasty, three-dimensional, you know, and it was important for me to do that because we tend sort of as a people to be stereotyped as a certain person in films, you know, yeah. So, but I was able to sort of really expand how each one would be in London. And the most interesting th thing that happened to me in London, you know, among many things, was the amount of different accents you hear in London, and very few of them are... RP, which is what the majority of television is full of, and radio. You, know, you get this sort of very distinctive RP accent, whereas all I have heard was Scots, Irish, South African, you know, all, the, all of the world. And in this film, somebody told me there's 15 different accents, and I wanted that. You know, I wanted those different accents because that's my London that I arrived in. Yeah. Um, you mentioned, Vicky, about the fact that it's, you know, it's a comedy, it's a drama as well. And I want to see a scene um, here when, when Dixie arrives back to, to the flat, and um, Shell's not very happy, basically. <laughs> <laughs> don't like you two arguing. <laughs> <laughs> Me arguing. So, oh. Was was there much improv, or was it was it was it kind of kind of what was done on paper? Do you know, Johnny was really flexible. There were some people that really wanted to stick to the script, and you absolutely could. You know, it was that kind of script where it was it was it was a very chatty script. So. Um, you know, it would have flowed just the same, but I like him pro and, and Johnny let me. So, um, especially in that scene, we um, we decided not to talk. I went a bit, you know, can we not talk for the day just to make <laughs> it a bit easier? You went a bit Shane Meadows on yeah, us, didn't I you? Did. <laughs> <laughs> Which is never a bad thing. Nope. And, it, you know, it gets the results. And we, we had such a good time shooting it. And, it, you know, it is a comedy, so it was meant to be enjoyable and we were meant to laugh all day and that's what we did but with this scene it it changes the tone of the film so much and you know Dixie and Shell are you know they're a really cute couple and then all of a sudden you know they've they've been you know this is happening to them and I wanted it to feel real and um, I think it did the job it did yeah <laughs> well, well what was um what was that experience like for for you when when she's coming at you basically it was brilliant, actually. Um, I, I don't want to give too much of the film away, yeah. but obviously in that scene, we spoke in the morning and Vicky sort of, like you're saying, got a bit Daniel Day-Lewis on me and said, <laughs> we're, <laughs> we're not going to talk for the day. And, you know, and we obviously what happens in those scenes is you, you film them quite a few times and mm. uh, we didn't speak and it, and it kind of had a desired effect. But obviously in the film, there's um, my character's relationship with his father, which is sort of not just symbolic of a father-son relationship, but, you know, he's meant to represent the part of industrial Wales is dying for me as well you know mm. these kind of my father was worked underground and all those kind of things and was a man that worked in heavy industry and that's dying in Wales and they had certain principles and, and characteristics which is important so that's going from his life so it's very symbolic when his father says to him I'm I'm gonna go now and he's yeah and I did the scene with Vicky and I kind of said to her um my father's dying shell in that scene and she does this amazing thing where she goes that's not fair bringing that and I can see she's saying it 
as, a, as the character, but as an actress as well, you know. Yeah. That's not fair to bring that in. And it's an amazing moment. And everybody editing went, that's the line we're going to use. So yeah. we were, I was able to sort of uh, improvise in ways with Vicky, which w was incredible. She was also really interesting as an actress. Every actress I've ever worked with, bless them, they've, they've been brilliant. But they always want more lines because they're actresses, you know, they want bigger parts. <laughs> Vicky would get the script and go, well, she wouldn't say any of that. <laughs> Page and <laughs> know that. <laughs> all that. And she'd like disappear in three pages and I'd go, okay. And as long as you got to that point of the objective of what that scene was, yeah. that's fine by me. You know, it's the, it's the great Scorchese line with Goodfellas where he says to Joe Pesky, you tell a story. And he says to Ray Liotta, you laugh. And then he says to uh, Joe Pesky, you're going to react. And he didn't tell him. It's all improvised, that stuff. And th the scene is electric and amazing. Yeah. And the rest, you know, sometimes you stick to the script. And there were actors, like Vicky said, who absolutely said to me, I want the script. You know, just and you know, I was like absolutely no problem at all with that. But there were others then, like like Vicky and Martin Freeman, famously would go, "I'm going to chuck them th some things out there at you if you don't mind." And I go, yeah, "Let's do it." You know, so you get different actors like different things, and it's about creating the environment that suits each actor, I suppose. Shall we? Shall we watch that Martin Freeman scene? <laughs> yeah. it's it's, uh, it's pretty funny. <laughs> just a look. <laughs> all his own clothes, by the way. <laughs> all his own clothes. All his own clothes Amazing. and not a million miles away from how he is in real life. <laughs> what, what happened was we, um, we he'd, he'd, I did this viral and obviously Martin's uh, s same age as me or maybe a little bit old. I'm not sure, but he's a mod uh, and a, quite a sort of fanatical mod that knows his stuff, you know. And uh, he'd seen this series through mutual friends and um, he asked to meet me because he wanted to be in it. But I had to meet him first. And um, within 10 minutes, he said to me, I was a bit pissed off about this series because I wanted to do something like this, you know? And I went, oh, fair enough. And he, uh, and he kind of like sort of did the thing where he went, he's a great character, quite spiky, really, you know, very sort of, you know, knows his stuff. And he went, what's your favorite Northern record, you know? And I was uh -huh. like, I like Candy and the Kisses, the 81. And he was like, good choice, you know? So you kind of see, he was not testing me a bit to see if I was the real thing. And I was kind of going, oh, yeah, I like this. And what's your favorite Jam B side? I was like, Dreams of children. He was like, yeah, yeah. So we had this chat, and then I went, well, look, you know, why do we bring that to the part? Why do we bring somebody that's literally going to this guy? You're, you're a mod. Yeah. You know, not having it, pal. You know, what's the story? So we did that, and he, nobody did it better than him, and I wanted to call him Don, you know, the Don of the mods. But he's this character who's sort of, you know, you've got to live in Frith Street. You've got to be into sort of Miles and Chet. You've got to dress a certain way, you know. Mod died in 1962, as far as he's concerned, you know. Forget, forget Brighton. It was all before that, you know. It was Ivy League, fanatical <laughs> mod. And that's what he did. He turned up on set that day in those clothes. You can't see them. He's got white ankle-swinging trousers. Shut like, yeah, I swear to God. <laughs> but like James Brown used to wear with cord shoes. These amazing socks. Cord oh shoes. Oh, yeah, cord shoes. He's got this jacket on, and he turned up like that. He looked amazing. And he sort of, you know, slotted in. And, and the thing was with Maxine... They'd never worked together before. I didn't think they'd ever met. Wow. And she was a Northern Soul fan. I knew this. And I always thought they would be a perfect couple. And she's the brains behind it. Because if you notice in the film, she kind of goes, go on, Don. But she gets her way. She, he's going, I'm not taking him on. But she goes, we're going to take him on. And she does that brilliant, yeah. subversive thing of convincing him. And I thought together they would look amazing. And everybody's seen that. Don and Ange, two rock and roll names, really, you know. <laughs> I thought them two together would be wonderful. And, and they were. They were amazing. I mean, there is an amazing... Um, you know, c cast all over the place, you know, whether it's faces you recognise, faces that you don't sort of thing, was the whole casting process, feels like it was a fun thing to put together in terms of putting those right people in those right places. Yeah, it was. I mean, what was really interesting about casting was I had, um, which is unbelievable, we had a 100% hit rate. I wanted sort of Vicky and I wanted Maxine and, you know, I asked for Michael Smiley because I wanted him to play a Northern Irish. I'd seen him in Kill List and thought he was yeah. really threatening. And I wanted Eddie Webber from the firm because he's got that South London, Bermondsey way of talking, you know. And so I asked for these characters and, and, and I got them, you know. Um, Katie Brand was interesting because I did a thing with her four years ago. And so she would, funny. But well, she'd do this Russian voice on it. So funny. And it was amazing. I thought I was stuck in my head. I thought, God, I'd love to get cast her as somebody like that, you know. So I was very lucky with the cast. And, you know, like Vicky said, we try to have a bit of fun on, on every film goes like, oh, we're like one big family, you know, together. But yeah. with, with Svengali, it was kind of, you'd bring people in for a day. Me and I was in every day. I'll never do that again. That was a four par. <laughs> you know, I was knackered by the end. But uh, Vicky came in for a while and, and stuff. And, and I purposely, lit, you know, took Vicky out of the script so that he'd miss her in the film. She disappears literally for about 20 minutes, a lot of people say. Mm. And I wanted that to be the effect of her, you know, in his life. 
Um, but the other people would come in for a few days. And, you know, when Carl Barat would come on set or Alan McGee, there was a frisson on the set. It brought an excitement. Yeah. And then Michael Smiley would come in for two days. And it kept things really fresh. And I like doing it like that. I don't know if I'll be able to do it again. But it's a great way of working because you just get really like, you know, oh, so who's in tomorrow? And Katie Brand. And who's in the next day? And yeah. Eddie Webber. It was great. The um, McGee. Who knew Alan McGee could act? I mean, he's he's yeah. he's... Really, quite funny in this. Yeah. It's kind of like he, yeah, as himself. Which is difficult, you know. Yeah, we, yeah, exactly. Um, have you guys got any questions you'd like to ask? I mean, I, I can go on for an hour or something, but it is a Q and A for you guys as well. So please, if you've got any questions, put your hands up, and we'll get a. Here we go. We got a gentleman right in the middle. Get a microphone to you. And get some questions from you guys too. Thank you. Hello. There you go. Hey guys. How you doing? Um, very good. Um, Quentin Tarantino. When he was, uh, I remember he, he was interviewed once and said, I wish I'd written Battle Royale. It was a film that he thought, you know, was very perfect for his writing style. It was something he wished he'd written. Is there a film or, or a character you wanted to play or anything you wish that you'd been a part of or written yourself? Easy for me. I wish I'd written Quadrophenia. <laughs> <laughs> and I wish I'd played Jimmy when I was 20. That would be my dream film. I think it was the most... Um, influential film on me because I seen it when I was about seven on VHS. I, had a, I was very lucky. I had an older brother who was into music, Chris, and he allowed me in his bedroom to listen to stuff. And he, I can remember my first sort of popular culture memory was Sex Pistols coming out. Uh, and he had the album and the colour. That's why Svengali is that colour and the pink. It was my first childhood memory and he played God Save the Queen and it really stuck in my head that. And then he had Quadrophenia on VHS and I watched it and I went, I want to be one of them, you know. And a bit like Dixie, I bought a really rubbish Parker. <laughs> I had some badges and stuff, you know. And I remember I went to Barry Island and I, you know those Kiss Me Quick hats, which are pork pie. I bought one of them but took the Kiss Me Quick off, so I had a pork pie hat, you know. And I improvised sort of being a mod. But I do think Quadrophenia is an, an astonishing film, amazing soundtrack and, and a, a great snapshot of how, what it's like to be a young sort of British lad, that great tradition we got on a weekend of dressing up on a Friday night and going out and, you know, this, this is a very British thing. This, this given us a sort of like subculture since, since the sort of invention of rock, well, the invasion of rock and roll into our lives. So I would say Quadrophenia and Jimmy. Vic? Well, my answer won't be as good as Johnny's. <laughs> um, sadly not, but... I, I was talking about Stand By Me today, and it's a film that I watched, you know, from a young age many, many times. Um, and it stuck with me. And it's, you know, it was, it stuck with, st stuck with me as a kid, and it still has now. Um, and I kind of spoke about it today, and it's reminded me. And actually, I could go back and watch that a million times. I just, I loved it, yeah. I did watch Quadrophenia a million times, not far off. Yeah, I, think I, wore I the VHS did a million out. and one. <laughs> <laughs> You mentioned, uh, you know, Quadrophenia, obviously, amazing soundtrack, and Stand By Me as well. Um, I mean, th this, this, this story is a love affair. It's not just a, a love affair between your characters. It's also a love affair with his love with music um, as well and stuff. How, how, how was the process for the soundtrack for this? Was it an easy thing to decide on? I mean, the, the, the options are endless for this, and... Johnny, Johnny was, throughout the whole film, I mean, the, the soundtrack could have been one thing, but either way, it would have been just as special. It was just every time he came up with a song for a scene, he'd be going, Vicky, I found it, it's this. And I'd be like, whoa, that's an amazing track for that. Or, and then he'd be like, oh, no, no, I found it. Uh, you know, and it was just the selection of music out there is, you know, astonishing, especially because Johnny had picked you know, a different track from every decade since the 50s. So, you know, it's a really, it's a really interesting sort yeah. of selection. You've got people like Jake Bug and Miles Kane down to, you know, you can... Well, I, well like I said, I, I try to do that thing of sort of picking a song from each decade of, since rock and roll has arrived in yeah. popular culture. But what I try to do is, it's, it's quite interesting, you've got to pick a song that selects a, a mood and all the rest of it. And, and I'm really pleased that Universal have put the soundtrack out and people are really picking up on saying this is one of the best soundtracks they've mm. heard and stuff, which is amazing. But uh, it had to be important and it had to be good, but it had to be quite eclectic. It couldn't be mod, because Quadrophenia is about a mod and this is, it's got a mod in it, but it's actually about the world of rock and roll, the Prems or an indie band and things like that, you know. Yeah. So I wanted to pick songs that could sort of move, you know, stuff like The Fall and then Jesus and Mary Chain, but Dexies, The Who and The Small Faces. So I try to do something where, you know, it could be a, a soundtrack that, you know, fits Britain's sort of relationship with rock and roll. And what happened was I, very early doors, we, we made the film and we, we decided to show it to some distributors and... Um, Bless them, Universal got involved almost straight away. So that was it, really. They said, we want it and we like it. And 
So we we went then and we showed it to them and um, there was a guy there, Richard Thompson, there was another guy there called Johnny Fewins who I knew worked for Virgin and was from a rock and roll background which was great. Yeah. And I met him and they do this great thing there actually which I would recommend where you watch a film and you all go away and write what you think. So you don't get that thing of negativity which you get in big corporations where you go, oh, I didn't think this. Yeah. You actually get the truth because nobody's scared of saying anything. And I met them both then afterwards and the first thing that Johnny said to me was, uh, you got Georgie Fame in there? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, I like that. And I was like, I know. So you <laughs> straight away you're, f you're finding connections with people yeah. who go, oh, you know music and I know music. And I was going, you were the guy that was arrested for putting God Save the Queen up in Virgin, weren't you? And he was going, yeah, that was me. And I was <laughs> going, I've heard of you. I know you, you know? So there's a kind of, you know, a connection you get with people through music, which is, you know, you don't get with anything else, you know, because yeah. I'm almost like, you know, a, a historian when it comes to music and, in, 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 you know, in our history, this country, c c certainly popular culture, I love it, you know? So I was kind of like finding people through the music as well. And people were saying to me, oh, why did you have that? And then I was going, because of this, you know? And I wanted to pick bands, you know, that, said something you know in the side like you know, obviously uh, one of the great bands of the noughties for me were the libertines i thought the libertines were you know epitomized rock and roll their yeah. attitude was amazing so i wanted uh can't stand me now in there you know and stuff like that and uh, i wanted the small faces in there because they were a band that i loved so uh, this soundtrack was essential to the film it had to be good you know and i'm pleased that we got there everybody. was also um sort of bands that aren't really that well known welsh mm. bands weren't they the yeah. keys which was great, and it goes so well with what Johnny's doing with Svengali, you know. Yeah. Giving bands a chance to get that platform, and that, you know, they're not going to get that opportunity, yeah. but it's like Johnny's gone, they're amazing, they're in there with the best of them, and great. they completely work, you know. What well an amazing platform. They email me lots of new bands, because of, the, of the virals and the spirit of the virals, they email me their music, and... I always take the time to reply to everybody. So, you know, Vicky always says to me, you know, you have two hours of replying to bands and stuff. It's more than two hours. Uh, yeah, but, you know, I... It <laughs> lives on Facebook. I do. But <laughs> what I do is I try to say to the, 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 the kids who are in bands, because in, in a band myself, is that I, I never say anything negative. I always try to find something positive, because it's really important that, you yeah. know, it's encouraged, because, again, it's a big part of British culture, that, you know, bands coming through, you know. And there's a band in a garage now. I use the garage metaphor in this. They were in a garage. They were a garage band. Somewhere practising that will just come from the left left field and they'll just change things and it's when we least expect it yeah. you know and all of a sudden because people sort of always go on over the X factor and stuff but that's always been the case there's always been opportunity knocks there's always been in the 50s you know Tim Pan Alley but what every so often something rises up and you know kicks into the mainstream yeah. you know like the mid 60s late 70s and Britpop and change things for a few years but it can't happen all the time it has to be like a wave it has to come in and it has to come out and yeah. it has to come in and at the moment it's probably out yeah. you know but it'll come back in and it'll be Hopefully a band really soon really soon <laughs> the Prems was the idea that you know they're, they're that's sort of a dangerous band where you don't know what's going to happen in this gig you know because I remember going to see Oasis early doors and I was thinking it could kick off you you know it's something quite feral very rock and roll you know, goes yeah. right back to the days of slashing the seats when Blackboard Jungle come out, you know, those that dangerous part of rock and all the darkness, you know, which is what you need sometimes, you know. Um, do, how do you, you know, in terms of like locations and stuff like that, and there's the there's obviously Berwick Streets in, in, in there, we, we saw that in that scene with you and, and Horsey and stuff, which is the location for the cover of Definitely Maybe Oasis. Was that deliberate? Oh, absolutely. Everything was considered. I yeah. did stuff like, um, I didn't want to get as cliched as the, the Abbey Road roundabout, although I did consider it. But I did, I do, did do stuff like go, I went past where, you know, with the first coffee bars where sort of Tommy Steele and that started off. I walked past there. That's where me and Horsey walk and where the original marquee was and, and, and things like that. So I tried to do as much stuff around sitting around Soho as I could with that. And obviously there's the places in Shoreditch and, and those areas like, you know, the old Blue Last and stuff. So I did sort of try to get as close to the way it would be now for a band to break through. And, you know, a few retro company people have said to me, it's amazing you've got the session with Mark, with who? Yeah. You've got him on Soccer AM, you've got the NME, which is the way, you know, you'd push a band through that sort of indie way of doing it now. So I tried to make it as authentic as I could there. And uh, what really happened was the virals, I used to get emails from kids in Japan and America going, oh, that's what Berwick Street looks like, you know. So I saw London as the set, really. I, yeah. loved, I loved Entourage for that, that series a few years ago, where they used Hollywood as the set yeah. for them. And I thought what I could do is I could use London as the set for Svengali, I could have Sowo, I could have Hoxton, I could have all those things where people would see and go, that's London yeah. in 2013, and that will always be London in 2013 then, you know? Yeah. Any more questions from you guys? Gentlemen down the front. Hold on, we'll just get your microphone so we can hear you properly. Thank you. Um, have you had a lot of interest, I mean, outs outside Britain, because it's, it's quite a British film, and I don't, I don't know um, 
What yeah. are people in the states and other places? Yeah, we went to um, we got we got into a, a festival in New York. I mean, Vicky went over in uh, October, wasn't it? And they really liked it. And I was thinking, you know, what would they make of my accent and things like that? But I suppose New York is is almost a European city, a bit like Boston. They they do they they're quite you know the Anglophiles there. They know our world. And I do get a lot of people saying that they get it uh, because London is still, I kind of think it's still the capital of rock and roll London, I think, you know, it's where the Beatles came and, you know, punk kicked off. And so uh, that was fine. Weirdly, the French like it and they don't really like sort of our films a lot of the time, but they like it. <laughs> they have asked me if I change the name to I Will Rock You, <laughs> which I'm fine with, actually. But what's quite interesting is that um, <laughs> it's, it's, there's a Queen reference in the film as well. And there's something to do with, w in the film they've got, um, Starring and they got introducing Johnny Owen, so I'm like I'm 42 with introducing me, which is fine. <laughs> but in France, I had to say it's okay to say something like uh, something like on screen for the first time ever, which is a bit of a lie. But that's all right. <laughs> so I've sort of gone along with that. But I was really pleased the French like it because I, I really like French music. You know, people like Jacques Dutronc yeah. and Miles Kane did a cover of it. You know, people dismiss French pop music, but actually it's really good. You know, Serge Gainsbourg and all those yeah. kind of people. So I was really pleased the French. So subliminally, I must have left a bit of my sort of love for France in there and they must have clocked it. But you'd think, you know, being a very British film that they wouldn't go for it. So I'm hopeful, you know, that America, I've got one American band on there as well. I've got Big Star on there. So yeah. we'll see. But the Americans are, they have a fascination with the British culture and British, and, and the history of British music as well. So yeah, well it feels I like a natural fit. Well, I decided to, to d absolutely not do anything for the American audience. What I thought was, look, okay, um, the Beatles, for argument's sake, cracked America because they were unashamedly British. You know, there was no concession to America. They just wrote songs in America. And I think sometimes the British acts that do make in America, and certainly films like The Full Monty, was just unashamedly about Sheffield, wasn't it? So sometimes I think the Americans can think, well, you're making that for us. Whereas a lot of the time they can just go, I just really like that. Train Spotting was a great example. That did really well in America, but they subtitled it, but it didn't matter. <laughs> they really liked the film, you know. And so I think sometimes we can try and make things for America, but the best thing to do is just make something that you think this is what you know you like and then you hopefully find the audience that likes it as well keep it true to you yeah. um any other questions from our audience oh amazing two more questions here hi right, guys john i was just going to ask about the budget really was there anything you couldn't do that you would have liked to have done that you just wasn't able to do because of the funds really no do you know what's really funny was that um we got uh, Martin Freeman to do it, uh, what you call equity minimum uh, in this country. And once he did that, everybody else sort of went, oh, okay. Because other people's agents would go, well, how much Martin Freeman doing it for? You must be, you know, X amount. Don't we go, no, it's equity minimum. Bless him. So that kind of sort of established that. So for acting talent, it was done, you know, for the love of the film. Um, shot wise, no, do you know, we had, we had steady cams. We shot with two cameras the whole time. You know, I'd love to say, you know, I'd love sort of big cranes and cherry pickers, but no, we, I had pretty much everything. And obviously because I'd done the virals, that the step up was, was great anyway. So I didn't kind of think of it. I thought myself as richer rather than sort of doing something that was in the, I was almost like looking up rather than looking down. And the same with the music soundtrack. Uh, very early, early on, um, a guy called Ian Neal who got involved with the soundtrack. Uh, we had to get in touch with Pete Townsend to get a song. And obviously bands can, they can charge what they want, you know, for a song, you know, because they're the who. But he agreed, he's obviously that scene with Martin Freeman, he agreed to do it for a, a, a fantastic rate, very similar to Martin. And once the who did it for that rate, we got everybody else. So again, right. we got 100% hit rate, really. They, I think, and I think they all wanted to be involved on the film. The only band that I really wanted to work into the film, and I, I, and I, I, I couldn't find a place for them, but I will one day, is I wanted the Smiths in there. And we had to get in touch with Morrissey and bless him, he said yes as well. You wow. Know. Yeah, so I wanted, uh, and I will, you know, get the Smiths in something one day, but I wanted, you know, something like them. But it, again, it was very similar. Martin said yes, actor said yes, The Who said yes, everybody else said yes. So it's always a good, good thing to start with somebody really big, get yeah, them in yeah. way. <laughs> Brilliant, it's a great tip for people. Uh, next question, did you want to ask a question? Hi, guys. Um, you were mentioning, uh, you've been mentioning back and forth about the element of the accent in the movie. Yeah. Was there any pressure to that to have a Celtic accent? That, uh, um, that I mean, it's going across the world. Yeah. I know the pain of people just not yeah. understanding the word you're saying. <laughs> Me too, mate. Me it's too. <laughs> it's a global thing. Yeah. Um, but it was is was there any pressure when making the movie about that about that being any sort of issue for you? No, there wasn't. Uh, you know, I totally agree. Um, all my life, people have gone to me, can you stay that again? Or can you slow down? You get that thing, you know, where you, they say to you, sort of, I think we speak at a, at a pace 
that's quite sort of you know difficult for people to understand sometimes. Um, but I think with Celtic accents, you can almost tune into them. And I had a fantastic tip from Irving Welsh, who was a great mate of mine, who's seen the film, and he said, what I did with Train Spotting was I, we started with voiceover, uh, very famously, and he said, what happens then? It's an interesting phenomenon. If you've got an accent that's particularly strong or Celtic, if there's a voiceover and you don't see the character speaking, the human being's ear tunes in because you haven't got the mouth to follow. And he said, once it tunes in a little bit, you're away for the rest of the film. So that's why I started with him going, my name is Paul Dean, and I'm, you don't see his lips. Just makes him work a little bit harder from the start. So that's what I did. It was a great tip for moving to say that. And, uh, and that's what I did. And, you know, quite interestingly, there was a great story I read once. Um, Michael Caine was doing a film called uh, The Man Who Would Be King with Sean Connery. And the great John Houston was the director. And Michael Caine said, I did this, uh, this thing which actors do where it was his scene, which is, I need a page long to say, and he took a deep breath and he spoke very slowly, you know. And John Houston sort of said, hey, Michael, can I stop you there? Why are you doing that? You're an honest man in this film. And I thought, what an amazing thing to say. I thought, if you speak quickly, the irony is you tend to be more honest because it just comes out. Whereas if you're slow, more considered, then you can't trust them. And I thought, you know what, Dixie being Dixie, he has to speak with a certain <laughs> amount of pace and rhythm because he's Dixie. So I sort of had them in my head and sort of stuck to them. Amazing. What great tips. Um, have both of you got a favourite scene from the film? Vic? Yeah, I've got one. The, there's a scene where Johnny goes, where Dixie goes back to Wales and he has to get on a horse. <laughs> that's, all I, that's all I'm going to say. To say that Johnny is also scared of horses kind of makes you? it a bit funnier. Yeah. Um, it just gets me every time. And it's, it's tiny. It's, and uh, it involves a guy called Shrek. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, you haven't even seen it, and it's... Yeah. I was based on a real character that I remember in this valley town about 15 years ago, that when Shrek first came out, and he used, to, he used to walk around with a mule. But in those small, great valley towns, he was kind of accepted, you know, mm -hmm. he was kind of, that's Shrek, you know, it's fine. And I, I was stuck in my head that, and I thought, I'd love to write a character like that. And we talked about things in the film, like uh, we, we shot Wales slightly differently colour-wise and, and Scotland at and things kind of slowed down a bit the way we were talking for the first time because we were back in Wales and the pace of life wasn't as quick as London because London is astonishingly quick when you first come yeah. there, that whole idea, come off the tube and everybody moves at a pace. So we did that and I always wanted this character to be waiting there at a train station with a horse, you know, <laughs> looking to pick up trade, <laughs> you know, so do you need a lift somewhere? So I kind <laughs> of, I did that and, um, and I, I, it played in Wales last week for a premiere and, you know, that they cheered at that bit because, I mean, it was just that bit when he comes to Wales and we found a fantastic song by the Pogues called The Boys From County Hell, which is almost sounds like something from like sort of hillbilly music, you know, like bluegrass start, you know. And uh, he's arriving in Wales and this train's kind of a proper valley town and this music starts and there's a guy with a horse standing there. You just kind of get straight away, you know, he's in a different world, only two hours away. It's a big thing, isn't it? You know, it's like even Glasgow and that. It's only four hours away in a train. But suddenly you're in a different world, you know, and I wanted to get that across. What's your favourite scene? My favourite scene is... Um, I think it's, it is probably the scene where me and Vicky had the argument simply because it's McClure at her best, you know. She does these amazing things where her voice sort of shakes a little bit as well, where she absolutely is in that moment where she tells him to get out of the room and her hand is shaking a bit. It's like, you know... You think yeah. she means this? <laughs> when, really when I was up. in the scene, I was like, oh my God. It's, like, it's a bit like you're a boxer and suddenly you're in with you know, Muhammad Ali or Sugar Ray Robson. You're going, I'm going to get battered here. And as I you know, at least try to defend myself, I was really aware that I was in with somebody that absolutely was on the money when it came to acting. And uh, that scene was, was, was a particular favourite of mine. It was, a tr you know, it was quite a traumatic scene to play in the sense of we were arguing, but it was brilliant. She, I, I do this weird thing when I start breathing <laughs> in a certain way, and that was the, what sh the way she sent me, you know. So I kind of watch it, and it's a bit like you become almost... It's like an out-of-body experience almost, isn't it? I have to say, not a comedy scene, but um, all the scenes with Brian Hibbard, especially the one on the mountain... Um, that's a yeah. beautiful, beautiful scene. Yeah. Um, and that is one of my favourites, yeah. Please, please, say Dixie's dad. Um, you'd both do drunk very well as well. I'd just like to yeah, commend you both. We genuinely weren't drunk. Honest really? to God. I swear no, to you, you I do drunk so can. well. That's not going to touch the sides. <laughs> so, yeah, I wasn't. We weren't drunk. <laughs> um, she did this brilliant thing, right, <laughs> where she said, um, I carry her on my back drunk up the street and we both sway in and... And, and, and as I'm walking along, um, we go into the house, and the idea is, is like, I'm going to tip her over, you know, and we're going to fall out. But Vicky says to me, 
why don't I piggyback you? Obviously, I'm like, you know, 30 and a half stone, six foot one Welsh, and I'm like, really? Can you carry me? She's like, yeah, well, I'll, I'll give it a go. So I'm like, all right then. So I jump on her back, <laughs> solid. I mean, like, <laughs> not even like a budge. And she's like, you're right up there? And I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. And they went, action. She carries me through the door, drops me off. Retake. And I was like, no, we've got to do that again. <laughs> was that really funny? Did you think it was going to get a laugh? That was it. Broken back. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, she was amazing. It was, that was Vicky's sort of idea to do that. And uh, obviously, we, we, uh, we, we fall into the flat and stumble about and stuff. And there's a little bit of improvisation where I go across the sink and I pee in the sink, if you remember. <laughs> yeah. Obviously, I'm not really peeing. And they put the sound on after and stuff. But it's a great bit where she didn't know I was going to do this. And she kind of looks at me and she goes, are you pissing in the sink? <laughs> <laughs> and it's actually her saying it, really. So everything <laughs> is in the voice of her saying that, you know. Um, yeah, so that was, a really, that was a good scene. It was but good it was fun. It was quite interesting because, you know, people have said to me, oh, this is kind of your first comedy. And um, it was things like saying to Johnny, oh, you get on my back, where there's a bit where you've, you've seen it in the clip today where Johnny jumps over the rubbish and then jumps back over the rubbish when he could have just walked round the rubbish. <laughs> and Johnny's like, that's comedy because it's all, you know, sometimes it's not in the line, sometimes it's a visual thing and it's, um, I really picked up on that and I think, you know, Johnny didn't go in there and say play for laughs. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's a real craft trying to get that right. And Do you enjoy um, it, the comedy oh, scene? Oh, I loved yeah. it, yeah. I, I mean, I... I it's not like I've done comedy for years, but it was something that I tr sort of trained with at yeah. the workshop for a long time. Um, and yeah, we, you know, you do have a, a, a sort of great fun doing it, and just yeah, it was good fun being able to be daft. Yeah, well, just I be stupid. I have a, I, I, sorry to be say, but I had a great time watching it. I know you guys haven't seen it yet, but it's uh, it's out in cinemas on the twenty first of March, and and also downloadable on that date as well, and then out on DVD on the seventh of April. You tell such great stories, not just here tonight, but in this film as well. So, and it's great to see you thank both you. on screen. It's brilliant, brilliant film. Thank Becky you, Vicky and Johnny. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.